What's up, Freaks? It's your boy Marty here to introduce us rip of TFTC. Thank you for joining us. Give this video a like. Subscribe to the channel. If you catch us on podcast apps, make sure you subscribe there. Give us a rating, a review. Go to tftc.io as well. Become a member of the site. Join the conversation. Truth for the commoner. Trying to get you the high signal content in a world gone mad. This rip was brought to you by good friends at River. River's here to make it as easy as possible for you to buy Bitcoin and then take it into self-custody. Go to river.com slash TFTC, set up an account today, uh, and you'll get $5 of Bitcoin after you buy $100 worth of Bitcoin on River. You can dollar cost average into Bitcoin with no fees. Uh, if you're just buying one off, River has the best fees in the industry. Uh, they back all their Bitcoin reserves one-to-one in multi-sig cold storage. Uh, they highly recommend that you take self-custody. They just introduced limits. So if you want to set a limit order uh, below or above the current Bitcoin price, River makes that extremely easy as well. They also have real customer support. You can pick up the phone and call them if you have any questions about your experience on River. So go to river.com slash TFTC, set up an account today. This trip is also brought to you by our good friends at CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is here to provide you with a new way to pay for your health care. It's not health insurance. Health insurance is notoriously expensive, opaque, impersonal. CrowdHealth is really trying to change that model. You pay a monthly fee. It builds up in an account. If you ever have a health event, you let CrowdHealth know. They go to the doctor. They negotiate the price lower. You pay the first $500 and the rest gets crowdfunded by the CrowdHealth community. They have Bitcoin lightning payments that they just enabled. So if you want to pay your monthly fee plus your doctor in Bitcoin over the lightning network, you can now do that. Uh, they've got a roster of doctors that you can access. Uh, they're approaching healthcare in the right way. It's a healthy community focused on preventative healthcare uh, and avoiding the big pharma industry as much as possible. So if you're looking for a cheap healthcare solution, you're not happy with your health insurance, maybe it's a bit too expensive. Try out CrowdHealth. Me and my family use it. Go to joincrowdhealth.com slash TFTC. Sign up today using that and you'll get $50 off your first month. Joincrowdhealth.com slash TFTC. Enjoy this rip. Yeah, it was fun. I got out of the cage though. I've been up for 12 hours already. It's only 2.30 in the afternoon. Good luck. Jocko Willock would be proud. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Did you run six miles? No. No, that was just up. You just just a wake. That's the first with babies. <laughs> that's the first part. Just getting up. I'll eventually get to uh, taking a picture of my watch at four thirty. Yeah, saying good. <clears throat> I can't do it. Anything before five can't do it. I I can't do anything before like six thirty. Yeah, which is bad. I'm trying to wake up earlier. Yeah, it's good for you. I think. Or yeah. it's bad for you. And then don't do it. I'm the opposite. I, I don't get inspiration to write until like ten p.m. at night. I stay up. I'm trying so, to get inspiration to write. That's why we're here, sir. I know. Yeah. Your writing's pretty good. This is my this is my accountability uh, way to make sure that I hit the publish buttons. I'm going to talk about it here, and then I'll have no choice but to publish. Yeah, TFTC, we like being accountability buddies here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At the show, in the studio, within the commons. Mm-hmm. You missed Sean Baker last night. I did. Well, it's someone's fault, but... He, he gave me a 10-minute warning. Someone else got a notification. I didn't get one. Turns out, because <laughs> I, I saw that he had just left. Yeah, yeah. Parker. Yeah. I said, get your ass back here. No, I love Sean. I mean, you remember when we first started talking? Like we were in his orbit at the very beginning. Yes. Because we were really hot on the keto side of things, and then we were like, who are these guys that are cooler than us over here? <laughs> They've taken it one step further. Who's this jacked monster that's only eating steaks? He is a monster. He crushed my hand last night. Did he? I went to shake his hand and say goodbye, and it literally audible knuckle crack on my end. You know he's a UT alum. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah, so he that's how Bitstein got in touch with him when he was a, not a student, but like, through that connection the alumni network yeah or something i mean maybe not official uh, the official channels but i think that was the initial spark interesting i didn't know that yeah he was in california now he's up in the pacific northwest you're making me think that i'm wrong on this and i could be (laughs) i think i have a memory that he went to ut for like grad school or something like that well sean if you're listening yeah confirm or deny yeah yeah the allegations of you being a longhorn yeah yeah 
That's a proud thing to be right now. Ten and one. Who did they lose to? They lost to OU. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, it's it's not that bad. Like I it's mean, a rivalry game. If you see OU coming out of the tunnel last weekend, it's pretty bad. It's pretty embarrassing. You lost to that team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, both my teams lost to OU. <laughs> SMU lost to them too. So I'm uh, I am embarrassed. I went to OU. I went to Norman. Not a great place. No, you didn't go to school there. You went to watch the game. There. I went to watch a game there this year. SMU played there because Texas fans never go there. They always play in Dallas. I went there this year for SMU. The stadium's like an architectural disaster. And I've never seen so many people limping. Limping? A lot of limps. Gout limps? Something limps. Like, there's just, I, I, it was like, it was notable. Like, I took a mental note of the fact that so many people were limping. This is just an odd thing. I'm not making any judgments. Boomer sooner, Sooners limping. Limping in. The they were pretty happy walking out. But <laughs> yeah. They were limping in. Yeah. The football culture down here is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. mean, it, I mean, high school's nuts. But yeah, I need to get to a Westlake game. So I mean, Pennsylvania's like that too, though. I mean, my high school is pretty good. Yeah. My high school is terrible. <laughs> I was a small Catholic school. But Westlake, yeah. That's small Catholic school too. My brother played with uh, Drew Brees for a bit. Drew Brees is pretty good. He's, he's okay. Pretty yeah. good. Is he in the Hall of Fame yet? Probably. Yeah, Justin Tucker's also from there. Best kicker of all time. He's a Hall of Famer. And we have two alumni on the Eagles. One of them scored a touchdown. <clears throat> the other one set up a touchdown. Yeah. Epic comeback. Damn. Oh, actually, Eagles starting quarterback, uh, uh, championship winning quarterback, also from Westlake. Jalen? Oh, Foles. Nick Foles, yeah. Nick Foles, yeah. Yeah. They've had a lot of them. He, uh, we will build a statue of Nick Foles in Philadelphia. <laughs> Call, yeah. Calling a shot at the Philly Philly play. Dude, he's so good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Westlake. Yeah. And that was the sports ball section of the TFTC. <laughs> Is that typical? I mean, I don't think you talk sports too much here. Matt and I talked about the Eagles yesterday. That's, that's true. Yeah, yeah. He's an Eagles fan. Big win. He was wearing an Eagles hat. It was hard not to yeah, touch on the subject. Yep. Which is a good segue into this. I mean, Matt. Yeah. So I worked with Matt a lot on the stuff that I'm writing about now, um, which uh, just to catch everyone up, um, I'm, I'm trying to get some writing out on basically product development, building software, and what I've learned over the past, shoot, 18 years of doing it. Um, mostly, <clears throat> mostly as a product manager or something close to it, a founder of a couple startups. Um, but, uh, I'm doing it not just to get it out, but, uh, because one of the things that helped me a lot were all those people that, you know, cause you were into the product development world for a long time is like the stuff I was reading in from 2004 to 2008 or so was so foundational and getting me started and giving me an opinion on how things are supposed to be done. But all those guys aren't doing it anymore. Um, and because so many of the Bitcoin companies that I interact with are started by, you know, usually younger people, I want to start getting some of that stuff out that, um, that, uh, I feel like I, I got a very good education on this. Well, I mean, I think anybody in the world who knows your background would agree because you worked very closely with Joel Spolsky, who is yeah, yeah. considered one of the OGs of the internet age, if you will. Sure. I mean, he's, you know, in some cases he's kind of like the original tech blogger, yeah. you know, before there were really, you know, blogs and people who were just setting up their own web pages. Um, Joel on software was like the only place you could go to read about someone's opinions on how to build software. Uh, him and coding horror, you know, who started stack overflow together. Yeah. I mean, and stack overflow is probably one of the most successful <clears throat> engineer, how would you describe it? Stack Overflow was an amazing community. Uh, it's a it's a forum, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the origin stories of it, it, you know, I wasn't there uh, at the very beginning, uh, but the origin story is basically that they were on a mission to uh, kill Experts Exchange, which was the the Q and A forum for programmers, but you had to pay to get answers. And so Joel and um, Jeff Atwood had started it. I mean, obviously there was a bigger mission than just killing one company, but uh, this idea uh, very early on that this should be out there for free um, and that we would find 
ways to make that's when i was brought in was to find ways to make money later <laughs> once it was successful as a forum and um but what was interesting about the those two guys coming together is that they had this huge install base of users because they were probably the two most prominent or widely followed uh bloggers about software development i think we were selling sure they're not just bloggers they also are software developers sure yeah 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 they, well and joel I mean, that's kind of the funny thing is that like i didn't know you could be something um other than a programmer and build software and joel was a program manager at microsoft worked on excel and all sorts of other. i think he's largely responsible for getting um like making excel programmable and getting uh basic inside of excel great uh great product um and uh but it wasn't until i started reading joel that i was like oh i don't have to be a programmer to do this because i'd programmed my whole childhood my dad was a programmer my brother my uncle like everyone around me were programmers and so rebelling in my family was not being a programmer and then finding out through joel and through his writing that you could do something else and still build software was actually pretty exciting for me but um yeah i mean i ended up joining stack overflow and uh joel had been this prominent writer he had a lot of opinions on how to build software but uh joel never you know as, as stack overflow started getting you know bigger we hit 20 people 40 people 100 people 200 people up to 300 at one point um <clears throat> most of his stuff outside of microsoft had been very small small teams and uh there was a point around 2017 or so where we decided um that we had to just reinvent everything like we we didn't like we we'd read all the books on agile development and uh i I'd, I'd done all the things that you know all the all the sort of cliche things you do when you're going through like scrum and all that and we decided that we were going to sort of build our own process that was really methodology um, agnostic meaning like you could throw kanban or scrum or forms of agile on top of it even waterfall if you wanted to uh, but that there seemed to be these core things that every time we were successful we were doing very specific things and every time we were failing it was because we didn't do one of those things that made us successful before and we just weren't consistent in repeating our successes and so we spent a long time on it um the other person that that was uh, a huge contributor in like the early forms of this was uh the vp of engineering at the time uh david fullerton and so it was kind of our ass on the line it's like we got to get better we got to ship we got to ship things that work uh customers need to be happy we need to make more money you know there were a lot of problems that needed to be solved um and so we just banged our head against the wall for about you know three months uh coming up with this and then really deployed this process into uh that organization and then over the years you know really it started that was like the genesis point for it um but uh w when i moved on to unchained you know i was starting to install this as we started growing as well we got up over 100 people um uh, as we brought on people like matt mcmanus who you had on here uh he was really helpful in helping me change it up a bit um for instance you know at stack overflow you can imagine you know it's a forum full of programmers trying to get answers to their questions uh now that's chat GP gpt of course um but uh <laughs> it's been rough um but <clears throat> we didn't really care that much about quality assurance for instance not only was it you know the stakes you know not only were the stakes lower but our customers our users actually liked finding problems with our site it was like a fun thing for them to go onto the meta sites and like tell us what was wrong and then as you can also imagine when you get to a place like unchained our customers don't like finding problems right the the stakes are much much higher when you're securing people's funds and so we had to put in a lot more accountability and checks not just into the quality of the software but into the um sort of unintended consequences of dealing with, uh, you know, disparate parts of the code base. Uh, so uh, it, it morphed a little bit, you know, through that. And then now at ZapRite, I'm working with John, who has a, you know, very different uh, skill set than a lot of founders. I mean, he's a designer, um, which is a freaking godsend for, for all of you that have started companies before you'll know that like if if one of the founders is not a designer d design usually comes pretty late mm -hmm. in the process um and uh, it's been such a 
privilege for, for me to work with him where um, that part of the product it you know before I was there was was fantastic and is only getting better and so anyway getting back to the sort of origins of this um, is that uh, we came up with a, a system uh, we just called it our stack overflow product development process that became the unchained product development process there's a lot of people that contributed to it other than me but uh, I do feel the need to kind of get this out and um, really the way I'm trying to describe this to people is that there are invariants for product development, things that you always have to do no matter what, right? And there's only five of them, right? And if you do them consistently, you'll ship better software. And especially for like, the, you know, the Bitcoin audience out there that are younger, um, it can be kind of overwhelming to see these, you know, huge books. I've never read a good product development book ever. Well, sorry, that's not entirely true. Uh, Ryan Singer's Shape Up is phenomenal. Uh, from 37 signals. Mm -hmm. um, they made Basecamp and Basecamp, you know, uh, few, uh, Trello, did it? No, no Trello Trello's was competitor. us. Uh, that was Fog Creek and yeah. Stack Overflow people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> most of these books are kind of nonsense, to be honest. Uh, most of them could be blog posts. That's why Joel and Software was so good. And, um, but this, this idea of invariance, what it, what it, what I'm trying to say is that um, the most important thing in software development is that you finish the job of solving problems at higher levels of abstraction before you move to lower levels of abstraction. An example of that would be strategy, like setting the strategy for your product team or for your company. And then lower down would be something like what I call discovery, which is where you design and specify very detailed things of what you're going to build. And then later on, when you're building something, your actual lines of code. So each one of those represents a descending level of abstraction. You're setting strategy, you're writing specifications and making designs and talking to customers and getting feedback on ideas. And then you better know what the fuck you're doing because you're writing code, right? Less abstract, less abstract, less abstract. This concept, <clears throat> or sorry, this way of, of working is very familiar to programmers, right? They have to think about data models first, abstract, bigger, has a lot of consequences, right? Then they might be defining classes, and then they're writing lines of code, right? So they deal in these layers of abstraction sort of just naturally in their jobs. But the other people involved in building software typically don't think this way. Uh, at least in my experience, most of the people I worked with that aren't programmers don't think this way. And when you're building software, I think it behooves you to think like a programmer. And so let's back up yeah. and start with the highest level of abstraction, which is strategy. What do you mean by strategy? Let's use Unchain as an example. Let's yeah. walk through one sprint that you guys did. And sure. Go through these levels of abstraction. Yeah, so this is great. So even a sprint, right? is a lower level of abstraction, right? Yeah. So it's strategy, strategy documents and, and the process of creating strategy is usually longer lived, right? So it, it, it will live past multiple sprints, maybe 10, 20, you know, or something like that. I tend to think that like a good strategy will last about a year, right? In, in the software world, maybe it's updated a couple times, you learn a few things, but like, again, at that level of abstraction, you should have put in the work where your strategy can work for about a year. What, what that really is, right, is it's not prescriptive, it's not a design, it's not a, uh, it's not a specification, but there's just enough requirements to narrow the field of possibilities of what you could build that you get something acceptable at the end. So a good example of Unchained would be we had a strategy uh, that we wanted to build a new monetizable business line. And that, that, and that we had made a decision on what that business line was going to be. That was going to be trading, right? Now, there's a lot of things you could do when you build a trading desk. <clears throat> and what we decided to do was to do it manually at first, talk to those customers, learn everything that they wanted, right? And then gradually build it into like an a, a automated process. But at the strategy level, right, what we were actually saying is something like, <clears throat> Customers at Unchained have Bitcoin being stored in multi-sig. All that Bitcoin was bought somewhere, right? So this is its resting place. Why isn't it their starting place, right? So we're going to allow people to buy Bitcoin directly into cold storage with keys that they control. It's a mouthful, but it is a strategy, right? Now, 
just saying that there's still a number of ways to actually implement this. And, and so there's a lot of creativity and autonomy that goes to the teams that are executing on that strategy. But, you know, this is also one of the things I see missing in, in organizations is that someone needs to know what the fuck is going on and what, 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 what you're supposed to do. Right. Um, how many times have you walked into like an organization and you're talking to one of the programmers or to one of the PMs and you're like, I don't know what we're doing. Right. Or like, you know, I'm working on this. It doesn't seem to matter very much. Right. That's a lack of strategic thinking. And there are people that are supposed to set strategy in organizations. Usually it's a founder or an exec or, you know, uh, a senior PM or a CTO or something like that. And, um, it seems that a lot of people, uh, you know, don't, don't follow through on that part of their job. I think, I think it's also very, very hard. Right. And, um, at that, at that high level of abstraction, you might ask like, well, how are you supposed to know what to do? Like, is it just some guy like, is this top down, you know, command and control, you know, <clears throat> style of building? Shouldn't we have more bottom up? And it's like, it is bottom up, even though it's my responsibility at unchained uh, at the time to set product strategy, right? I would be a fool if everyone's fingerprints on my team weren't all over that thing, right? The job is, uh, of the person setting strategy is to be in an information advantage to earn the right to, to author that strategy, right? So if you're not in an information advantage, you have no business in setting the strategy for, for the company or for a product team or for, you know, whatever. So how do you get to an information advantage? Well, you have to talk to customers. That's the number one thing. If you're not in regular contact with customers, there's no way you can possibly set a strategy. Two, you have to have a different type of relationship than just a managing relationship with people on your team, right? You have to actually know what they know, learn what they've learned about the product, about the usage, about the anecdotes and the data that are coming through. You have to um, have a, you know domain expertise in what you're doing. I think domain expertise it's more and more overrated the further down you get uh, in the layers of abstraction, right? So setting strategy, you got to know your industry, right? Writing code for it, it helps, but it's not as important, right? A good programmer can be a good pro programmer for Microsoft or Unchained Capital. Yeah. And so what it seems like you're getting at here, it needs to be a lot of communication. Uh, between the engineering team amongst uh, members of that team internally and then externally to the rest of the company. Yeah. To make sure that you're striving towards that same strategy and everybody knows where you are uh, in terms of fulfilling the goals of that strategy. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, the input is customers, people on your team, the engineers, everything, you know, inside the company competitive knowledge, all that the output is now it ends up, I mean, being a document, right? You know, you create a document it says, you know, unchained trading strategy, right? And you're writing out why this matters to the customer, what the business case is, how you're going to measure whether you win or lose. Right. And then the really, the hardest part is, is defining the requirements for it. Right. Because at a strategic level, like what you don't want to do is end up writing a bunch of product specifications. Those aren't very memorable, you know, strategies should be short. Uh, everyone on the team needs to remember what it says, right? They don't have to reference the doc over and over and over again, right? It needs to be, it should be funny. It should be, you know, engaging. It should be good writing, right? Um, but memorable is probably the best thing uh, that a strategy document should be. And how you get there might be, you know, brainstorm sessions and whiteboards and all this stuff. But at the end, you need this artifact, this like this thing that, that everyone is going to be driving towards. And it, and it gets more important the more people you have in an organization. Like at Zapp, right, right now, it's easy, right? There's four of us. You know, we can, we can get together, we can do it, we can write the doc, everyone remembers. We're all in the same room every single day. But at Unchained or at Stack Overflow or at Microsoft, right, you, you get from dozens to hundreds to thousands of people that have to understand what this thing is. The more memorable you can make it, the better, right? Yeah, that was one thing you referenced towards the end of the blog that you haven't pr pressed publish on yet. But at the end, you asked uh, basically your readers, like, can you go to your team and ask for three 
free piece of information. Yeah. The fact you just described. Yeah. And then two other pieces. So I say at first is like, say you're an engineer. Uh, uh, can you show me the specification that you're working off of? Right. Did someone write down what you're supposed to be doing? Um, and it, that can't be a to-do list, right? People, that's one of the, the tragedies in how people have interpreted agile development over time is they take a Kanban board or, you know, Trello board or whatever, and they put a, you know, a title on it and a description of what they're talking about. And that's their spec, right? That's not going to cut it for the most part. Like you haven't done your job as a product person or as a engineering manager, if that's what, what someone's working off of. Right. Um, so you take those, uh, first of all, do you even have that document, right? Then is there a strategy document that that's in service of, right? And then just go ask someone who's tangentially related to the product development process, not the holy trinity of designers, PMs, and, in, and engineers, but go ask someone in marketing because they have a role to play in this process, right? Um, towards towards the end uh, of delivering this project, uh, this, this software, this bit of software to the public. Ask them what are the most important things being worked on? Most places you can't get all three of those. Yeah. And on the last piece there, it's always a funny ongoing battle is usually between sales and marketing versus engineering. Like sales and marketing guys are going out and pitching things to customers sure. and then coming back to engineering and be like, yeah, the customer wants us to go build it. And so is yeah. setting up this, these invariances and internalizing them in the company culture does it prevent that type of problem? Yeah. I mean, it's it, a good process should prevent that type of problem. Right. So I've always found this problem to be the most hilarious because it's such a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. Right. It's like the salespeople are selling products that don't exist and they hate their engineering team because they're too slow and they don't know what they're doing at any time. And they know everything that the customer wants and the engineering team doesn't know anything. And I always say like, that's the whole reason you have a product manager. If that conflict didn't exist, then there would be no reason for there to be product managers. I tell this to PMs all the time is like, if you don't have an engineer, you can't build software. So you have to have them. If you don't have salespeople, no one's going to buy it. Right. Uh, if you don't have designers, it's going to look like shit. You're the only person who's expendable here. Your job is to make every single one of those people better. And if you can't, then you're bad at your job. Right. And the only way you can do that consistently is just by having some process in place to make sure that those inevitable, you know, conflicts arise because again, it sounds, it sounds so silly when I'm saying it out loud, but like you're on the same team, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, if the defense is mad at the offense, like, um, it, it's not going to be a very good culture and clubhouse, right? You're going to have trouble hiring people. You're going to have trouble, you know, your coaches are going to get fired and that, the PM's job is basically to make all of those people better and they do it by writing things down. It's that simple. Well, things that they write down is important, right? Uh, I, I talked about the inputs and being at an information advantage at a lower level of abstraction from strategy, say in discovery, right? Is where you're actually saying, okay, we need to build a trading product. Now I'm going to write in very specific detail what that trading product's going to do. There's because in the strategy, it didn't um, nece necessarily state that um, that uh, you had to be able to um, reach final settlement in 24 hours. But you might decide that the only way we're going to win in the marketplace is if we can settle to Unchain's Vault faster than you could settle to Unchain's Vault if you bought through Coinbase, right? So all of a sudden, you have a new requirement in there. This has to happen, and it has to happen within three hours. I don't know. Right. Why? Well, because you can buy it somewhere else and you can send that Bitcoin to an unchained vault. And if that's faster, then people will, will just continue to do that. Right. The, it'll be at its final resting place quicker, which is what people want. So that's where you're writing these very specific things about what the requirements are. That's not necessarily in the strategy document. Right. Hmm. And the strategy document should really. Again, it should narrow the playing field of what the acceptable options are for um, for the software to do right. You, you don't want to say like, we're going to do trading and then someone goes out and builds a custodial wallet that says, okay, people can trade into this now. And you're like, nah, you, that's not, so it has to have some specificity, but, um, again, you, you have talented engineers, talented PMs, talented designers, um, working on this stuff. You want to make sure that you're giving them just enough 
so that they can go be creative and make really important decisions on the implementation layer, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel like I should back up real fast. I actually named these invariants, right? So the first invariant is not while it uh, aligns with the str strategy sort of atomic unit of product development, um, I call it think and then do, right? But thinking first is very important. And I've been surprised how few people actually think things through before they get going. What are some examples of people not thinking things through? I'll give you examples on my, uh, of me, right? Is, uh, let's see, uh, stack overflow. Uh, we'll start there. Um, I was really convinced that, uh, we could launch something that stood next to Q and a, and it wasn't just me. It was obviously lots of people, but we as a team didn't think this through that we could launch, uh, something that we call documentation, right? That we had, a bunch of programmers writing questions and answers, just putting stuff on the internet, creating these nice little artifacts that um, that people could use. I thought that we could get them to create another type of artifact, which is long form documentation. And um, before we, you know, did the things that I know you're supposed to do, we just started building it. We started writing code, right? This was what the best documentation product would look like. We took it to market and it flopped like <laughs> bad. And when we went back and looked at our product development process, we realized we didn't do the things you're supposed to do to be successful. Not that we wouldn't have spent time on this, right? But very early on, because when it was failing, we start talking to people. Why aren't you doing this? You have a bunch of rep on Stack Overflow. Why aren't you also getting rep over here? What we found is that um, people like being prompted, right? The types of people that, you know, the answers are, very important, right? And you know, there's more answers than there are questions, right? We need a lot of people competing over getting good answers because that's how you get good answers. Um, and uh, those questions are very important because it's prompting the the person with knowledge to say, "Hey, come give us some of your best stuff, right? You know how to solve this." Documentation is very open ended. How does this API work? It's like, well, it's not a super motivating thing. It's a, it's a nameless person asking how it works. Like, how do you even know to, to get started? Why, why do you think you're the person to do this? Right. And we never asked those questions to begin with, like at all. Right. Um, so, you know, not thinking before you do in this case, uh, where in writing strategy is like, there is no primitive before it. Right. So the only thing you can do is think. <laughs> And then you can start doing stuff. So in this particular case, you guys skip discovery. Well, yeah, in this particular case, we kind of pretended we had a strategy without validating it. Right. And that's an important thing also with each, with each one of these phases. And let me just say it real fast. Cause I feel like I need to set, set this up a little bit better. I, I, I think there are five sort of proto atomic units that all teams need to do in order to ship quality software consistently. And that's have a strategy, run a process called discovery, which is basically the design specking, you know, user feedback loops, a build phase where you're actually writing production code, right? A quality assurance phase where you're making sure that that code does what you want it to do and a delivery phase where you're taking that to market, right? Five things, right? And each of these, each of these proto units, I'm giving it an, an invariant name to. So that strategy phase thinking then do the discovery phase is don't design without a strategy, right? And again, I want to repeat this because it is the most important part is that you have to finish the work at a previous layer of abstraction at a higher level of abstraction before you start on the next one, or else you run into these problems. We hadn't finished in the documentation case, the, the, uh, the important work in the strategy phase before we were just jumping into discovery and saying, this is the best documentation thing we could build. This is what it looks like. These are all the little tools. This is how it's going to integrate into our reputation system. We just got really, really excited over this thing, but we hadn't asked the most important questions. We hadn't solved the problems at the higher abstraction level. So what would the important questions have been to ask. Ah, those are the good ones, right? So like, it's really like, what is the output of a strategy doc? Like, what problems have you solved? What decisions have you made? You've usually done about four or five things just depending on the product, right? Uh, or what you're what you're building, you've usually made a business case for it. 
how's the business going to get better, right? Are we going to make more money or less money? Is this a loss leader? Is this something that's supposed to make us profitable? Do we get more traffic from it? What do you, you know, what's the business case? How's this help the business? Why do the customers want this, right? And usually you have data and anecdotes leading to a, a thing that says like, we know there's a subset of people that want to do this or a lot of people that want to do this or a new group of people that want to do this that don't answer questions, right? Then you want to say, what are the minimal requirements here? Like if it, in a good metric for a good strategy is that it's so bare bones on the requirements that it does not work if one of the requirements is missing. Like there's nothing, there's no fat on the bone at all. Mm -hmm. If you take away one thing, the whole thing falls apart. That's the right level of abstraction there. And then finally, you have to have some sort of idea of how are we going to tell if we're winning or losing, right? Those are metrics, KPIs, things like that. How do we know whether or not this software, this feature, this new product line is doing what we thought it would do? If you can say those things, right, and you have a compelling case, not only you know can you say them, but when you show them to your team, they get excited, they believe you, right? You've been persuasive, right? Um, then you have a strategy. If you say all those things and you're getting a lot of pushback, did users really say this? Did you talk to anyone, <laughs> right? Um, did, have you looked at this data about how many words go into an answer versus how many words there are in document in a, a good, a well-documented API? Like, um, you know, these aren't the same things, right? The motivations are very different, right? If you get that type of pushback, then you second guess yourself. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe you haven't solved the problems at that higher abstraction level that you haven't earned your way down to writing those specifications that you get really excited about. Yeah. And so it's a documentation product comparing it to the pure Q and a, mm -hmm. the answers were typically shorter documentation is way longer than a quick way longer. Answer. It's unprompted. Um, and, uh, that there were relatively right. Relatively few people, that were interested in doing it. Also, another weird thing is that it turns out it's someone's job, some team's job in, in really big places like Microsoft to write documentation, right? There are people whose entire job it is to do that when they release a new product, API, integration, whatever it is, webhooks. And um, really, if we wanted to be successful, we would have talked to them first because they write all the documentation in the world, right? Mm -hmm. You talk to them first and say, would you do this? Right? What would they have said? I'm not doing this no. twice. No, <laughs> I'm not doing this twice. Right? How much are you going to pay me? Yeah. Right? Um, it, you know, it was and look, I'm, I'm, I'm picking on this one example. It, it's not unique. I mean, like, but one other thing that I, I, I think I stole this. I'm going to look it up after this. I think I stole this from Peter Thiel. But like the stakes are higher at the higher levels of abstraction too. Right? So you make a mistake in strategy and you fail, no one gets better. It's a tragedy every single time. You've just wasted everyone's time, money, treasure, whatever it is, right? When you fail at lower levels of abstraction, the consequences get less and less, right? You make a bad decision in discovery, right? You start writing code, you have to fall back there. It's less expensive than having to fall back all the way to strategy. You write a bug in the code, right? And it gets out, well, you can go back and fix it, right? It's a lot easier to fix words on a page than it is a uh, data model, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and so like, you know, catching those problems early on is way cheaper uh, because uh, the stakes and the stakes are higher. So it's like, you have to put in the work there. Yeah. And so in terms of timeline, I mean, you referenced earlier strategy in software development world, typically on a, a year cadence, Mm -hmm. And how do you break that year up in terms of like how much time do you spend on discovery? How much time do you spend writing code? Is that predefined once you have your strategy set? Yeah. Or that's what I kind of like about these like atomic units. And then like the, the, the invariance here is that, um, you could get through all five invariants in half an hour or an hour for something small, or it could take you months to get through every single, uh, stage of this. Right. But, Typically speaking, it really depends on what role you're playing. I have this little breakout. If you're a product manager, 
you're going to spend more time at the higher levels of abstraction and strategy and discovery than you are at the lower levels of delivery and, and building, right? If you're a marketer, you're going to spend more time at the end, at the, at the lower levels of abstraction than you are at the higher. Uh, if you're an SRE, you know, you know, you know, it, it differs, but Typically speaking, it's like when I say that the strategy document needs to be a long lived document, it's um, it's because if things are are changing a lot at that, that level of abstraction, then you don't really know what to do. Right. And so how long does it take you to know what to do? I don't I don't know the answer to that because it is different in everything. Right. But for like trading, for example, at Unchained, that was like a new business line for us. It, it probably took us a couple weeks to convince ourselves that we really wanted to do this. And then we spent an inordinate amount of time in discovery, a long time in discovery because we didn't feel the need to immediately start writing code. We we're like, well, we can hire a trader and they can just start and we can tell our customers, you call the trader, they'll execute trades and put it into your vault. And we did that for a very long time. Now it's not necessary that you do that, but we were just really building up that validation that was the case. And also it allowed us to change some things in our code base that would really allow us to build the automated solution. But I'll go back and just say like, you know, the strategy process in general, if, if the person authoring the strategy document is good at their job, they, they've already, they're already setting up the right meetings with their teams. They're talking to customers doing all this and you need to inflict a new passion upon your team. Um, then yeah, usually a couple weeks, right? Discovery is, is the, the part where like the designers and the PMs are playing the most role, uh, the, the biggest role. And really it just depends on like the complexity, right? Um, are you inventing something new or is there a comp somewhere out there in the marketplace that you really like, or are there three that you want to use together? An example of this would be when I first joined stack overflow, one of the things we knew was that our messaging system, uh, where, uh, for our recruiting site, um, uh, where you hire programmers from, from like the stack overflow, uh, user base. Um, the messaging system was really janky and bad. And, um, and we used a little trick that Joel and I talked about a lot, uh, and David, uh, which is like core versus context is like, is messaging core to our business? Like, is it going to help us win in the marketplace or is it context? It's going to, uh, it's just something that needs to be there, but we don't have to like be the best at it to win in the market. Right. And so something core you want to spend a lot of time on and something that's context, you want to spend as little time on as possible. And so if you use that framing, you can say, well, you know, if we're going to in the discovery phase, like if we're going to do this right, better do it fast because we have more important things to do, right. That are going to help us win in the market, even though this is a necessary component for the, for the, um, product to work. And then, I mean, you referenced Scrum earlier, mm -hmm. and so you have the spectrum of what I would define as like liberal approach to product management and then conservative um, waterfall on the conservative side. Yeah, and more command control on one side, yes. waterfall, more bottom up, uh, more chaotic um, on the, on agile, the agile side. side. Yeah. yeah, and so on the agile side, like that's where you get Scrum masters, weekly standups. Point I'm trying to get at is. Yeah throughout this whole process as you're going down the lower le levels of abstraction. Mm -hmm. Like one thing that people talk about a lot is like have as few amount of meetings as possible. Sure. Like when do you reach checkpoints at every level of abstraction when you feel the need to be like, all right, we need to get everybody on the same page here where we are. Yeah. You know what saves meetings? Emails. Writing well. Yeah. Right. And having artifacts that are traceable findable, you know, that relate to the other things at the higher levels of abstraction. So if you write a spec, right, you just put a little link into it and saying like, Oh, by the way, we're solving this part of the strategy, right? When those things are traceable, you need a lot fewer meetings, right? When we talk about like the waterfall to, to agile spectrum scrum, and I like scrum actually quite a bit. Um, I don't necessarily agree with like the titles people get and things like that, but especially in very large organizations, scrum can be awesome and you can use it on top of our process, right? Um, the invariants are not a methodology, right? You can do waterfall through it. You can do scrum and agile through it. You could do stage gate through it. You could do all sorts of things. Um, but on that continuum, it's like, 
yeah, if you want to have fewer meetings, it's um, the people that are solving the problems at the higher level of abstraction. If they've written those things down very, very well, then maybe they have to talk to two people and those two people have to talk to 10 people and those 10 people have to talk to 50 people in a typical organization, right? But you, right, by writing that have made everyone's job much, much easier. Yeah. Good writing. Well, and this is, you know, the, you know, I call them the agilistas in, in, in my, uh, in my blog post is like, you know, I've read the agile manifesto. It doesn't say not to write things down. Right. You know, somehow between, you know, 2000 and 2010 or something, uh, the agilistas of the world decided that, you know, not only is writing things down dumb, but you know, changing code is fun and easy. Right. <laughs> and we should just do everything in code. And again, I've read the agile manifesto. It says nothing of the sort It gets perverted into this. Like we can never know what we want to do. And so let's just start writing code and hopefully something good comes out of it. It's in fucking insane. Right. There's this guy, Jeff Patton. He writes a, uh, I, 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 I think about it every week. Uh, he wrote a blog post in 2008, uh, you can tell when I was like coming of age in this, uh, <laughs> in this, uh, industry, but he wrote a, he wrote a blog post in 2008 called, um, uh, I don't want, I, I, I don't know what, what I, sorry, let me start over. It's called, I don't know what I want, but I know how to get it. And he's explaining the difference between iterating through a problem and incrementing through a problem. And he has this beautiful uh, diagram or uh, sort of imagery set up where it's uh, the difference of someone thinking about painting the Mona Lisa. And the first person, the only thought they have is a woman in a pastoral setting. That's the only idea they have. A woman in a pastoral setting and they're supposed to make the Mona Lisa. So how do you get the Mona Lisa from that idea? Well, you iterate through it. You don't really know what you want, but you have this process to get it. And so you start sketching with pencil and you're like being very, very careful about things and you're erasing stuff and you're, you know, changing it up a bunch that's iterating. Right. And most people in agile teams are iterating through almost every problem. And then you have incrementing and this person, when they're thinking about painting the Mona Lisa, they have an image of the Mona Lisa, <laughs> right? So what is this person going to do? This person's going to paint the Mona Lisa right? That's incrementing. They might paint this corner first, but they're going to paint it very, very well. And they're going to paint over here and they're going to do this. And yeah, they still might do some sketches, but they're going to have a much more direct way to painting the Mona Lisa instead of the person who had. And so no, iterating and incrementing, right? They're both valid, right? You can imagine if you have the picture of the Mona Lisa in your head, right? And now say it, it takes 20 people to paint something because you're going to paint it on a mural or something, right? You're going to be very command and control in how you get from point A to point B, from idea to, to solution. If you have the idea of a woman in a pastoral setting, then um, it doesn't do you much good, right, to just be command and control. You're going to have to sort of tell a lot of people, I have this image of a woman in a pastoral setting. Why don't we try 10 different things of what you think that means and then I'll pick the best one and then we'll go on that, you know, a little bit more in the software world. Um, they're both valid approaches to, to building things, right? What I've found is that there's been this time where everyone thinks every problem should be solved through iteration, which is again, sometimes valid, but what's the onus on the person who's supposed to know what, you're trying to do, right? Is there any accountability? Why do you have execs? Why do you have VPs of product and CTOs and things like that? If no one ever knows, can picture the Mona Lisa in their head and then tell you what you want to do, what they want to do, right? Uh, I think it's a abdication of responsibility. Now it's not to say that, that every organization needs to be top down command and control waterfall style. Right. But the fact that like that's been completely rejected in many circles is insane. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was transitioning from finance to Mitch attempt to foray into product yeah. management, I did the, uh, UX UI front end development design bootcamp and waterfall was completely like Voldemort, like yeah, yeah. not to be mentioned. Cannot do it. Yeah. It was, it was in 2014. So it was like the height of 
mm-hmm. agile scrum. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that, in that time, if it is a dirty word to be called uh, waterfalls, oh, it's a shop that does waterfall. You don't want to work there. Yeah. 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 But that's what uh, I really like the analogy you use where it's, it doesn't have to be either or you can combine both and mm-hmm. what you need to do as a product manager is be a salmon. Yeah. That's yeah. We can swim upstream. Right. So if you have these, like these, uh, these, um, you know, atomic units, the, the strategy delivery build QA and delivery, right. It might sound very waterfally and you have to finish all the work up here before you can go here. It's like, okay. But, um, if, we go down one layer of abstraction and we're trying to write a spec and it's not coming out very well, then we just go back to the strategy and we iterate through that loop. And then once you have the spec and you're getting into the code base and you're saying, well, actually what we didn't know is that this is going to cause us to write this gnarly migration, right? That's going to be an absolute nightmare and keep us up all night, you know, on the day of launch, maybe we can do this a little bit better. Uh, you iterate through that problem, right? It's not a linear process of of strategy down to shipping the software. It's this constant back and forth, right? And almost every almost every single project you'll ever do will require some form of fallback, right? The important thing is to know what mode are you in, right? Are you iterating or are you incrementing? Because you'll work differently uh, in in both those stages. And two is how do you know to fall back, right? How do you know to fall back and how quickly can you get those cycles to go? Right. Um, and then when you get really big, right, where you have 10 different product teams doing 10 different things, you want to pipeline these things, right? You want to be, you know, some teams are going to be at the strategy stage of their process and another team is going to be at the discovery phase and you want different people going back and forth, um, you know, pipelining through that process, but it doesn't have to be waterfall. It could be waterfall. Um, but if you look at Scrum, it, it's very similar, right? There's, it, it's, it's, it's narrower because even they typically don't get the strategy phase right because it's more about like just a sprint. What are we doing during the sprint? What is, what is the input into the sprint? You know, prioritization, blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, write, write specs for two days and then we're gonna code for a week and a half and then we're gonna test it, right? And, um, and they have all the different names for the people that do all this stuff. Um, they, but even they understand that there has to be some like structure to how do you graduate from one phase to another? How do you know you're ready to write code? Even in scrum, right? You're not writing code on day one uh, of a sprint. Uh, typically, uh, you could, but it's not typical, right? You have planning sessions, you have specking sessions, and then you have coding sessions. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, we can swim upstream. We're salmon here. We can go from delivery all the way back to, to strategy. Now that's going to be more expensive and you have to do a good job at each stage, but, uh, it doesn't necessitate that you're right. That a lot of times when I presented this to people, their first question is like, is this just waterfall? I was like, if you want it to be, it can be right. Um, but it doesn't have to be. No. And <sighs> So do you think how many uh, teams out there in the world do you think are applying your strategy right now? Like what, are, um, what are examples of teams shipping good software? So I've, I've interacted with a lot that, you know, everything I'm talking about here is like derivative of something else I've learned. Right. And so there are teams doing variations of this, you know, I, for all I know, Stack Overflow is still doing this. A lot of the people that, PMs and things that I hired there are still there. Um, Unchained still doing this. Saprite's you know starting to do this, although we're four people, so it's a little bit different, right? I know uh, I've talked a lot to the Cash App team in the past. Um, they have an excellent product organization, really excellent product organization. It's small, it's tight knit, and they get shit done. They do something very similar to this. Um, it's a little bit different in some cases, but like, but like they check the boxes on the big five, right? Mm -hmm. They just get through it differently than, than I typically have done it. Um, Microsoft, uh, has certain parts of the organization that will do this. It's too big. You know, the product teams are too disparate and all over the world, but there are certain teams there, um, especially on the Azure team that do stuff like this. Um, uh, I've talked to people at Facebook. They're not doing this. <laughs> not even close. They uh, spent what? $40 billion on meta. It was completely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is that the worst strategy phase failure of all time? It's, it's a really confusing one. I'd like to know what inputs 
the people that set, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and his colleagues that set that strategy, like, because a lot of the strategy is you have to have some idea of what this is going to cost you both in treasure and in time, right? Did anyone start that process and say like, we're going to spend $40 billion on this. And everyone's like, yep, that's a good idea. Right. <laughs> right. Like, I don't think so. Right. And it could end up being a perfectly fine product, but if it costs 10 X what it was supposed to cost, is it a good product? You know, it's like the product might be good. Customers might like it, but it wrecked the company. Right. And now you can't share it, you know, photos on Instagram or something because you can't afford it anymore. I don't know. Right. Um, uh, similarly, I mean like, you know, it's, it's kind of like you, you can't avoid disasters all the time. You, you have to have some tolerance for risks. I, I don't believe in like zero tolerance. Right. However, is it's about consistency, right? And it's about being able to repeat a process over and over again and get reasonable results. So, you know, one of the one of the ways that I would you know ch check the process on this is that like um, you do I don't know a monthly demo to teams, right, to show them what's what's about to come out, right? And in that demo, you tell people, okay, we had decided to do this three weeks ago, right? We said it was going to take three weeks. Today we're demoing the final version of it, and tomorrow we're shipping, right? You have this accountability set into like some sort of ritual that you go through, right? And uh, part of that ritual has to be at the very beginning of saying like, how much is this going to cost us? How much time, how, mu how much is it going to cost us in time and in money? Right. And if you don't have a concept of that, it's really hard to hold yourself accountable. Yeah. Yeah. And you touched on it, mm -hmm. particularly with larger organizations, like creating those pipes across teams that are at different levels of the abstraction layers of these strategies that they're executing on. But I think we should dive into this a bit more, particularly for the companies in the Bitcoin space yeah. that are reaching maturity and looking to scale. Like what is your advice to product teams that are reaching that, that point in their company life cycle where they're going from 50 to a hundred to maybe 500 employees. Yeah. Like how do you manage that growth as a PM? Yeah, it's tough, you know, but, um, the, uh, I'd say there's probably three things that I would advise. One is even if you're not a command and control style of company, right? Hierarchy does matter and accountability matters, right? Um, and it really should flow upstream. A failure in strategy, I, I say, is always a tragedy, but it's always the fault of the people at the top, right? Head should roll if your strategy fails at the top, right? There has to be consequences for this, right? And it's not the programmer unless, you know, it was the CTO that came up with it, you know, that's going to pay the price for that. Just like when there's bug in, bugs in the code base or there's sloppy, uh, you know, specifications or bad design, you know who to blame. Like when strategy fails, you know who to blame. Do you know who to blame, <laughs> right? Who's setting the strategy at your company? Are the founders doing it? Are some early key hires doing it? Um, knowing who's responsible for what as you get bigger is a pretty big fucking deal, right? And a lot of times, uh, what early startups that are graduating into that 20 to 40 to 50 people is that you've had people that are kind of responsible for everything, right? And now all of a sudden there's a lot of people and you can't be responsible for everything anymore and you have 10,000 customers and, and uh, so what are you responsible for and what are they responsible for? And then you hold each other accountable. And the only way to do that is to have some sort of process that you go through in order to say like, I'm going to say I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do it. And you'll know I did it because X happened. Right. Mm -hmm. So you solve that through process and you solve that through, through, um, sort of ownership over certain things. The second thing I would say is that, um, uh, don't trick yourself into thinking that like writing things down is a waste of time. A lot of early startups are started by engineers, right. Uh, or people, designers and engineers and product people, you know, together, and they can say, well, it's going to take me four hours to write this down. And then, uh, it's going to take us two hours to code it. So why don't we just code it <laughs> and just do it. Right. And then you run into problems because you haven't documented that and you have a fact and you have all these things. But if you had written the spec, you could have just taken that out and put it in the fact and everything would have been fine. Is that, uh, documenting these things is an important ritual to start even very, very early. Like, uh, you know, John and, and Parker and I at ZapRite, like, you know, we write things down. We wrote down a strategy. We, we write down specifications for payment links that came out. Right. And, uh, sometimes our programmers who are fucking great 
uh, can I'll finish writing something. I'll send it and I'll wake up in the morning and they're like done. I'm like, well, that took me three days you know, <laughs> to like, to like do, but at the same time it was worth it. They wouldn't have been done that fast with that level of quality if I hadn't written it down the way I did. Right. Um, so writing things down is worth it and creating checklists. I love checklists, but you know, having a Kanban board with just a couple things saying I need to build a, a login system is not writing things down, right? That's a to-do list, right? To-do lists are not specifications. Um, and, uh, that the earlier you exercise this muscle, the way less problems you're going to have building like a reasonable culture of shipping quality software later on in the business. And of course you're starting this business because you think it's going to have 50, a hundred, 200, 500 people, right? Make sure you're a part of that or make sure that you're setting yourself up to be a part of it as it succeeds. Uh, because when it does, it can be really fun or it can be rather tragic when everyone hates what they're doing. Yeah. And I can imagine a world in which maybe this is the world in which we live in. It doesn't need to be imagined, but using Zappa as an example, starting with a four person team, yeah. writing all these things down, you guys are going to be wildly successful, get to a 50, hundred person team. Absolutely. You can use those artifacts from the early days as sort of like an onboarding thing that you hand to. Oh yeah new employees or it's like, Hey, here's how we've done things historically. You can see how we built every part of this product up to this point. Yeah. I, I, I can give you two examples of that actually, which is, um, when, when we first did this at stack over before we, we formalized this, we didn't have much right in terms of like, what's the stack overflow view of how we build software. Right. We had some, some blog posts from Joel from 10 years prior. Right. But we didn't have much of an identity ourselves. Once we did, and we had that documentation, you're right, that goes into onboarding docs, right? And so, you know, we did all this before I had hired a product team, right? And then we hired, you know, 20 people on the, hire, on the product team. And um, onboarding those people, every single person would come back to me and say, like, this was the best freaking onboarding I've ever had. Day one, you had, you had all the information I needed to learn how to do this job very, very well, right? Same thing happened in Unchained is that, you know, I'd already had that experience. And so when I joined Unchained, it was fairly small, you know, um, you know, 13, 14 people, uh, probably total, um, you know, four or five engineers, uh, no designers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and so, you know, I didn't come in like, you know, like a jerk and say like, Hey, things have changed. But like over time we built, some of that process in a lot of it looked a lot similar to what we did in Unchained. Some of it changed quite a bit, but then when I was onboarding a QA team, right, for instance, or, uh, you know, we hired 15, 20 engineers. Um, it was very easy to say like, this is what's expected of you, right? This is how we do things here. Right. And a lot of product people are very scared to do that to engineers or to designers and say like, I'm giving you, I'm putting handcuffs on you, right? We're a stodgy, you know, business. It's exactly, I can guarantee you in 80, 90% of the cases, the engineers are going to be like, thank God, because they've all worked at some shitty company before where someone comes in and they're usually working in a panic because they don't know what to do, but the results aren't going well. And they're saying, fix it to an engineer, fix it, build, build a product that makes us money, you know, build a product that converts better really is converts better a, a spec is that a strategy you know and then they go in and they're like okay what's going to convert better less clicks and it turns out less clicks is worse than more clicks and they have no fucking idea what's going on and then they're sitting idle for three weeks because they don't know what to do right there's no strategy and like if you can show someone when they're coming on board the first day we have a way of doing things here right you don't even have to do it my way, right? I'm just doing it as a way that's been successful to me. But if you have a, an opinion on what is going to work and how we build software at this organization, you have an identity around it, then yeah, onboarding people is a breeze and you get complimented on it and it makes you want to do it more, right? Like you put some effort into that and, uh, you know, someone that's coming up is going to, um, you know, they're going to make a commit on their first day at work. Yeah. It makes you more effective as a company trying to scale. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, and, and really that, that moment of like somewhere between 10 and 50, right. It's like most of those aren't gradual. Usually you're like 10, 12, 15 people. And then all of a sudden you're 50 people. Cause you raised 5 million, $10 million, right. In the, in the VC software world, at least, um, not in the bootstrap world. 
that'll be more gradual but like you know it's all of a sudden you go from 10 people to 50 people and then all of a sudden you're at 100 and you're like holy shit that it's been eight months right uh that's happened to me twice now um and i think it's a fairly common thing especially in this easy money world where vcs are writing 10 million dollar checks off of you know powerpoint slides is that it's going to be the experience of a lot of people uh that are uh, in the Bitcoin space starting companies today, you know, in 12 months, you're, you're gonna be surrounded by 50 people. Yeah. It's funny thinking about all this. I write every single day. Yeah. You you're mentioned a great writer. Thank you. I'm gonna shit on myself here. Uh, <laughs> because I, like it's my goal with TFTC to bootstrap. Like I just have this fascination with bootstrapping the business. Yeah. Bootstrap to date. And I really want to make this a, not a large company, but hopefully we get to like 10 to 20 employees at some point in the next decade. Um, the fact being, I write every day and I've never read, written any of the strategy stuff that you're talking about. Yeah. It's something we only have myself, Logan, Trevor, and one other person, but it's something I tried to do. I hopped a notion a few weeks ago to put some like documentation down and I just, never, yeah. I just fucking glossed over it. And yeah. It's a different type it. of writing, right? Um, yes, no, I'm not good at the type of writing you're doing. That's what I'm trying to get into is more public, you know, writing for a more public audience. I'm very good at writing for, you know, our company, our, you know, what is our mission? What is our strategy? You know, specs, you know, any, I, I can write all that very, very well. My advice to you would be like, cause I talk to you a lot, you know, we work 10 feet away from each other is, um, is I know you have a vision. You've told it to me many, many times for what we want TFTC to uh, turn into is that like you just put yourself like you know one of those lock yourself in a room and I'm not coming out because you could write your strategy in four hours I know I just gotta do it yeah it's tough yeah. and then it's gonna help every single person that you work with yeah like immeasurably it's gonna save you so many meetings it's probably the biggest problem between Logan and I is my uh you feeling me Logan Logan what do you what do you think about my communication skills when are we doing RHR this week uh, probably 1 p.m. tomorrow or Thursday. We'll see it's what's Tuesday. tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what month it is. So it might be December. It's tough. But it's tough though, like juggling all these balls, like trying to do the content, run the business side. Um, just thinking of like my business. And yeah. Cause I do want to add more tech aspects to what we're doing, but yep. it is, you've convinced me and I just need to do it, but like lock myself in a room and do it. And then that'll have profound knock on effects. Do you ever listen to Theo Vaughn? Yeah. Okay. So I, I was, I was driving back from Dallas, um, a couple days ago and, um, uh, I was listening to his podcast. I can't, can't remember who the guest was, but, um, he's explaining this exact same problem. He's like, man, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I'm the boss. And you know, I know what I want to do with this thing, but like no one else knows what they want to do. And it's not their fault. It's my fault. I don't know how to do this. You know, like I'm a stand up comic, but now I have a business and I don't know how to run a business, you know? And what he's basically saying is like, I know what this needs to be. He is the guy who has the picture of the Mona Lisa in his head. Right. And what they're doing in the podcast is they're pretending as if it's a woman in a pastoral setting because he hasn't been able to articulate that yet. Right. And so, you know, look, you know, I, I say the strategy document is, is, is a document that's well formed that answers all these questions about the business case and everything. But oftentimes the things that come before that are just as valuable, right. Is getting your team in a room and saying, locking each other in a room and saying like, okay, this whiteboard by the end of this is going to be full of stuff that describes our mission, describes what we're building, describes how it's going to make us money, describes how it's going to get our, our viewership up and all this stuff in that blackboards going to look like a fucking mess at the end, but everyone in that room is going to understand it. And then it's just translating that into a written word. That's understandable for anyone that wasn't in that room when you did it. Right. Um, I think, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, Ryan Singer, uh, before, mm -hmm. Uh, at a lower level of abstraction, maybe this will help, is that he wrote something <laughs> in 2004 called, uh, he's still writing a lot, he wrote Shape Up like two years ago, but I like his older stuff as well, called uh, uh, something, something, something Design Patterns. It's about building design patterns where he says like, okay, you wanna write a spec, you know, you wanna build a new dashboard for ZapRite, you know? Um, 
just start with a uh, first thing column bits. What's a bit? A bit is uh, a module that says how much Bitcoin you've earned. Okay. Bit number two, a module that says how many, um, how many dollars you've earned. Next thing, a module that says how many invoices you've sent out a module that says how many payment links you have live. You know, you're just listing bits, no priority, nothing. Just literally a bit is a piece of UI that's on the screen. How many pieces of UI do you have on the screen? Right? You just list them out in random order. And then it's like next stage group the bits, right? Take these bits. Are they logically aligned in any way? Well, the, the total Bitcoin and the total dollars, those kind of sound similar things. We're going to put those together. Bit one, bit two are related to each other. Bit four and bit seven are related to each other. So now you have the bits and you have them grouped and then you say, okay, prioritize the groups, right? So a is the most important thing. B is necessary. C is nice to have, right? You group those up and then it says, last one is sketch the groups and you just draw little boxes. This is roughly where it goes. Okay, I can do anything. I can do any web app, single page web app or anything. That process I can do in 20 minutes, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's the way to get out over writer's block. I'll do them for strategy docs too. list the bits. You know, they're not pieces of UI, but they're points I'm trying to make, you know, and like just anything you have. Some people use note cards, some people do, you know, whatever, but like this like design pattern thing that Ryan Singer put together, uh, uh, you know, I, I hope he hears this at some point because I think he'll think it's hilarious that someone still uses that strategy from, you know, 2004 that he wrote. Almost 20 years later. Yeah, but I, every time I give this to like a, a PM or a designer when we're doing something, it's like, huh, let's just do a design pattern for 20 minutes together. Okay, let's list this out. Let's group them. Let's prioritize them. Let's do it. We're 20 minutes in and someone's looking at me and they're like, I got it from here. It's like, it's amazing how much like that level of organization, which is like barely any at all, will completely change someone's trajectory on a project. Right. And you can use something like that. You know, I use that mostly at the discovery phase of, um, of this particular product development process, but it can be used in other phases as well. Like just to get you going. Yeah. It's fascinating. Process is key. Yeah. It all seems so simple. Sometimes I feel very stupid saying it sometimes, but when I show it to people that have been doing this for a long time, they'll say like, I've never done it that way. Like, oh my gosh, that actually is very helpful. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's the time aspect of actually writing. It's funny. I, I wanted to say this earlier, but now's a good time to bring it up too. Like the bent part of the reason it started is I was getting inundated with emails and texts, like what's going on with Bitcoin the yeah. price was running. And the other part was I was trying to get a product manager job at the time, oh, cool. having never been in the industry and the feedback I got when I kept getting rejected from jobs was, all right, if you never build anything, like prove that you can write about something. Mm -hmm. And so like the newsletter was multifaceted where I could teach my friends and family were asking me about Bitcoin, about Bitcoin, and then prove that I could write about a particular product, which sure. was Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. Um, Think about what, uh, I mean, like, I mean, that's really interesting. Think about like um, what Amir Taki did for the, the core protocol, right? With BIPs, mm -hmm. right? I th I'm pretty sure he invented the BIP process. He did. It was the first time outside of like, you know, the mailing list or something that like people were actually writing down with specificity, like, what are we, what am I trying to do next? Right now it's, it's necessarily different than what you're doing with TFTC or what I'm doing at zap, right? But like, even that alone was a huge, huge, uh, change in, uh, Bitcoin's development, a little bit of structure when a huge, uh, uh, took, took the whole, uh, project much, much further. Yeah. Create a process a Bitcoin improvement process. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think, I think it's a fantastic thing. Yeah. Yeah. Bips. What's your favorite bip right now? My favorite bip right now? I don't know. What do they call them in lightning again? I'm watching bolt they're 12. Lips. It's changed lips. a lot. I was, I was in time bolt. Yeah. It's just bolt. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what it stands for, but, um, I don't know. I, I worked in multi-sig for a long time. I'm not a lightning expert yet. I'm catching up. Um, but, uh, no, uh, bolt 12, I'm keeping tabs on, you know, uh, right now is my favorite thing, uh, to, to read about. Uh, also, uh, I like the, uh, I've been 
implementing uh, the Ellen address spec and the Ellen URL verify part of that um, as well, and then sharing it with people that we're integrating with right now. That's how we did the GitAlby um, integration. It turns out a, there are a lot of wallets that have done that have followed very well the Ellen address spec, but have not done the Ellen URL verify part, which is that right we need so that when a transaction is is uh, sent to one of those, we get a message back saying it's it's been received, like it's been paid. Um, so I've uh, been reading these a lot and like, yeah, the fact that there are specifications for this, like you can't have an open protocol without specific. I, I know that there's no, there's no spec for Bitcoin or anything like that, but there are specs for Bitcoin, right? Like there's not a spec for Bitcoin, but there are specs about aspects of Bitcoin. Yeah, like right? standards, like PSBT. yeah, standards and, and BIPs and bolts and, you know, all of these, it's, it's very important to get, um, you know, conformity around this. Like you need interoperability between the protocol and industry and industry and other industry. Right. Yeah. And, uh, having those is super helpful. And, and we're, we're at a point in lightning in particular right now where there's some very attractive, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of very attractive reasons to be uh, very native to Lightning instead of doing proprietary APIs. On chain, there's still some problems with that, but like in the Lightning world, it's like most of these integrations, you don't have to do anything proprietary at all to be interoperable with other wallets, other companies, and things like that. It's very, it's very nice. It's very encouraging. Oh yeah, it's huge. Um, on chain, will always have some problems with that. Um, it's because of the different address structures or it's because the final settlement and the way it works. And like, you know, for instance, like the Ellen URL verify stuff, like, um, we could just, you know, build an API between us and every single lightning wallet there is right. And saying like, well, you send us, you know, invoices and then, and then we'll show them and then they get paid and then they get deposited in your wallet. And then you have to tell us, you know, back and like, we could do that on a proprietary basis. And a few years ago, we may have had to, right? However, now we can use the Ellen address uh, spec and the Ellen uh, URL verify spec, and we can do the same thing on a non-proprietary level that can be repeated with anyone that we work with, right? And implementing it just so happens in this case to be very, very, I won't say trivial, but simple in comparison to other things. Well, in Bitcoin, there's just, there's other drawbacks. Uh, you can do it in a native way, but uh, uh, there, you run into problems like uh, there's no communication layer on the main chain to say like, hey, start at uh, this index uh, for addresses and you know, you know, oh, they're getting, they're getting other invoices paid over here, right? You need to know about that so you don't try to use one of those addresses again. Like yeah. there's like little things like that that you just can't really solve for. Yeah, I've and so proprietary APIs make more sense. I've experienced this with BTC Pay server when you have another yes, yes. <clears throat> of on-chain invoices that don't get paid in your wallet. You get big gaps. You and, get big gaps. You yeah. get a gap forward and Sparrow. And yeah, and then you look on your Trezor or on your on-chain. You don't Bitcoin. see it. And you're like, what the fuck? And you're freaking out. And yeah. but it's there. Yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah. just got to go gap forward a thousand addresses to find it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like, so yeah, there, there's going to be some like drawbacks there. Um, uh, so proprietary APIs do make a little bit more sense. But I mean, there are native ways to do it. Just give me some XPubs and I can increment addresses, right? Um, it's just when lots of people are trying, you know, if that if that vault or that that wallet is not specific to this use case, then we can't know what's going on outside of it. Yeah. And, uh, and you run into these types of problems that and lightning. You can, I mean, you can completely avoid that. Like it's not an issue yeah. at all. God, you feel like you're on the cutting edge again, coming from stack overflow into Bitcoin. It was an interesting process for me because, uh, very much like in very early in my career, I, I was like, well, if I'm not writing software, like I'm, I'll go be an, I banker, you know, cause there's nothing for me in the software development world until I found that product management was a thing. Um, and that I was good at it. Um, similarly for Bitcoin, it was like, well, if I'm not contributing to the core protocol, there's nothing for me to do here. I'm not that interested in building, you know, an exchange, you know, a casino. So like, there's not much for me, which is a really weird way to, for me to think, uh, it was uh, Parker Lewis actually, as as we were talking, probably in 2016, 2017, that started to convince me that he was like, "Well, you know, if Bitcoin's money, what's the product of money?" And I was like, "I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> he said, 
financial services, of course, right? Um, Bitcoin itself can replace, you know, the centralized uh, Fed and central banks, right? But there's still going to be a need for products out there that solve the problems that financial services do now. And they're going to look a lot different, right? And even if they look familiar and similar, they're going to be based on something that's very, very different, right? Uh, um, and so it was that realization that made me think like, oh, I do have something to offer here. And it took me a little bit of time because I loved my job at Stack Overflow, like loved it. I loved working with Joel and David and everyone there. Um, so I wasn't like super motivated to leave, but in 2019, uh, uh, it would, it became, I'll say untenable there. Uh, Joel had moved on, uh, just a few months prior. I wasn't enjoying it as much without him around. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, typical Silicon Valley, New York startup type stuff. I didn't fit in too well anymore. And, uh, so to Bitcoin, I went. Yeah, and thank God. Bitcoin needs people that like this, and like you know, there's so many talented engineers there. Um, they were starting to get a lot of talented product people. Uh, although it was it, it wasn't the case even four years ago when I started on it. Well, let's end up with a pitch to product people out there. It might be on the edge. Like, what kind of mark can they leave on the world if they were to come over and build? On yeah, Bitcoin? actually, I, yeah, I like this. This is a good way to end it. Is um, is if you are talented in the software development world, if you're working at Microsoft and you did something great, or if you're working at Google, or if you're working at Meta, or if you're working at any of these places, right? But you think Bitcoin matters, right? Is there are companies that need your expertise. We're building software here. And while Bitcoin core protocol is necessarily very different than the types of software you would build at Microsoft, right? The companies that are, you know, the industry building on top of that, the Unchains of the world, the Zapprites of the world, the TFTCs of the world, all of us, River, all the great Bitcoin companies, it's the same thing. <laughs> you're, you're just building software, right? And so we need talented people that uh, have learned from the best um, to, to be coming over. And it's like, if you, do, if you don't think that, that you have something to offer, you're just wrong. Um, and I, 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 I was in that uh, sort of mindset and I was just wrong. Um, is that all these companies need you, um, that they're well financed, um, that they have, you know, actually I, I find typically that um, Bitcoin has, uh, Bitcoin companies that I've engaged with have uh, incredibly well-suited founders for the stage of company that they're at. Meaning that um, these aren't just people trying to build a new marketplace, a new SaaS thing that they're going to flip for $200 million in a couple of years, is that they have passion and they have vision for what they want to do. And if you're joining something, nothing, nothing can be more important than knowing what the vision is. Um, if the vision is to go work in San Francisco and to flip your company in two years to Oracle, right? Fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't really get me excited. And I bet you these people listening right now that are working in those types of jobs aren't very excited. It's very exciting to work on something where the vision is something that you're actually passionate about. So I would encourage you to uh, know one, that your skill set is needed, and two, that uh, the conditions in which you'll be coming into are a hell of a lot more fun. Yeah. Oh, I'm jacked up. Yeah. I wasn't expecting this conversation when you approached me a couple of weeks ago, but I'm very happy we had it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to actually get this published. I'm going to publish it um, on a new ghost site that I'm setting up. And then also on the Zaprite uh, blog, because, you know, Zaprite is going to work. Um, it is one of those things where I'm sure I'm going to blink and we're going to be surrounded by 50 people. Um, and, um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we'll be cross posting it on uh, Zaprite. And yeah. I've paid two Zaprite invoices this month, so it's oh, really? working. Yeah. yeah, it is working. Yeah, it's really funny actually. I, I found um, I found a lot of weird people I w wasn't expecting: dentists, lawyers, you know, using Zaprite for invoices. And then on the payment link side, is a little bit more standard. It's just you know people that sell things and want Bitcoin, and we know a lot of the people that do that. But um, yeah, no, it's been really encouraging to see you know, John's initial, you know, version of it with, with some of the new stuff on here is like, it's, it's been, it's been a fun last few months, uh, since Bitblock boom, when we launched payment links. Yeah. It's been great. I mean, see the team that you guys have gathered. It's fun watching you Parker and John. Yeah. Do the damn thing. Are we going to win? We're going to win. Yeah. 
you get people like John starting companies like this, like he has a vision for what he wants, right? Mm -hmm. Passionate about it. Like we, we don't struggle with a lot of the things that typical software teams struggle with. So yeah, we're going to win team of killers. We're, gonna we're all going to win. We're going to win. You heard it here first. Will, it's always yeah. a pleasure, sir. Thanks, Marty. Peace of love. The key.